Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story. On today's episode, we're going to pretend like these stores haven't already taken down all mentions of Halloween and replace them with Thanksgiving or Christmas decorations. That's because today we're going to travel back in time to the days of the Salem Witch Trials by covering the movie The Crucible. Released in 1996, The Crucible was directed by Nicholas Heitner and stars Daniel Day-Lewis and Winona Ryder. The screenplay for the film was written by Arthur Miller, who was also the man that wrote the theatrical play that the movie is based on. That play is also called The Crucible and was first performed on Broadway on January 22, 1953. Since then, it has been revived on Broadway a couple times, in 2002 and most recently in 2016. In fact, the movie's director, Nicholas Heitner, himself is a long-time stage director, so it's perfectly natural that he would be the one to adapt the story written for the stage to the big screen. As a little bit of trivia for you, Arthur Miller originally titled the play Those Familiar Spirits, but then he ended up changing the title, a crucible being another term for a very severe trial or test of some sort. And that's very fitting for the subject matter of the story as it revolves around the witch trials that took place in Salem, Massachusetts in the late 1600s, before the United States was even a country of its own. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before starting our story today, there are two things we need to do. Now, if you're a longtime listener, you already know what they are. But if you're new to the show, welcome. The first thing we need to do is set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. Here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of those things are actually true, and that means that one of them is an all-out lie. Your task throughout this episode is you're listening to our story today, trying to find out Which one is the lie? Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, John Proctor was executed alongside Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse. Number two, more than 19 people were executed during the Salem witch trials. Number three, Abigail Williams never had an affair with John Proctor. Got him? Okay, now, as you're listening to our story today, keep your ears peeled because throughout the episode, somewhere throughout the episode, I'll mention two of those facts, and those are the true facts. And then by a simple process of elimination, the one that you don't hear, (laughs) you'll know that that one is the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Now, the last thing to do before getting into our story today is to get a quick recap of what we've covered on the producer's feed recently. And there have been two bonus episodes. Now, as you know, or if this is your first time listening, you may not know, for minisodes on the producer's feed, we look at some of the real-life inspirations and historical details mentioned in completely fictional movies. So the example I always like to give is Pirates of the Caribbean. Obviously, there were real pirates, but... Obviously, the movie was fictional, so talking about some of the things that the movie used in a completely fictional story to help make it seem grounded in reality, something like the pirate code that we see, actually was a real thing, and so we learned about that in the minisode. Now, I call them minisodes, but sometimes those minisodes are not really that many, (laughs) and that was the case this time when we covered The Matrix on an episode that ended up being about an hour and 40 minutes long. And then we had an actual minisode, a much shorter episode, a Halloween-themed minisode about the movie It. Now, those two bonus episodes brings us up to a total of 31 bonus episodes on the producer's feed, with plenty more planned. So if you want to get access to the producer's feed, all you have to do is to sign up to support the show for, well whatever you want. It is on a completely pay-what-you-want model. It's just my way of saying 
Thank you for the awesome people like Sadiqwa, who is helping me pay the bills around here and keep the show going for yet another episode. Now, if you want to be one of those amazing folks just like Sadiqwa, you can do what she did and head on over to basedontruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedontruestorypodcast.com slash support. All right, now let's begin our dive into the historical accuracy of the crucible. It's dark. Winona Ryder's character, a girl by the name of Abigail Williams, wakes with a start. There's a girl in the bed with her, and with a little shake, Abigail wakes the girl. Quietly, the two girls together get out of bed and place pillows where they were just lying. They cover the pillows with blankets, so if anyone were to peek in at them, they'd think the two girls were still in bed. Then they sneak downstairs and out the side door. It's dark outside, but it's also light. It's the kind of lighting that makes you think perhaps this is very early in the morning. The camera cuts to another house, and we see more girls sneaking out of their homes. Then... An overhead shot shows even more girls as they quietly make their way down the empty dirt streets of the town. If you pause the movie, you can see 12 girls at any one time on screen. Speaking of pausing, let's pause the movie ourselves here for a moment because, surprisingly, the movie doesn't give any sort of indication of time, date, or location. I'm assuming this was meant to be early in the morning only because of the dark blue light that we see, sort of like how I'm assuming that this is set in the 16 or 1700s only because of the way the girls are dressed and the style of homes that we see as they sneak out of town. As viewers, we're left to guess at this, though, because the movie doesn't give any sort of indication of time or date. So before we continue further, let's turn to history to date what we're seeing here and give ourselves a geographical setting. All this is happening in Salem, Massachusetts, but I mentioned that in the introduction to this episode. Now, Salem is located on the east coast of the United States. It's about 15 miles or 24 kilometers to the north of Boston, Massachusetts, and about the same distance to the south of Gloucester, Massachusetts. If that name sounds familiar, that's because the port of Gloucester is where the Andrea Gale was from. That's the boat whose story we covered on episode number 130 of Based on a True Story about the movie The Perfect Storm. Our story today takes place a good deal earlier than that one, though. The year is 1692. Salem has been in existence for 66 years and has quickly grown to being one of the most important seaports on the new continent. At this point, of course, the United States was not a thing yet. As such, Salem was an English colony. More specifically, it was one of the settlements in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Boston was considered another settlement in that same colony. Now, with that little bit of establishment of time and place, let's go back to the movie's storyline. The key plot point here in the beginning shows a young Abigail Williams and a number of other girls in Salem sneaking out in the night to the nearby forest. Once there, a slave named Tituba leads them in some sort of ritual. Tituba is played by Charlene Woodward, by the way. In the movie, it's not clear at first what the purpose of is for this gathering of girls. They're positioned in a circle around a pot that's sitting on top of a fire, and on the ground there's some sort of a symbol. We start to get a sense of their purpose when Tichuba asks them what they brought. The girls each seem to have some flowers in hand, and one by one, the girls kiss the flowers in their hand and put them into the pot that's boiling water over the fire. As they toss the flowers into the pot, the girls start naming names. Joseph Baker, Richard Wilkins, Daniel Hopkins, Daniel Poole, Adam Town, William Bridges, Jacob Poole. There's a long list of names. Each girl names a different boy. 
The ritual has gotten more intense now. Abigail hands Tichuba a white sack of some sort. Tichuba opens the sack to show a dead chicken inside. She takes the chicken and starts swinging it around, scattering the girls a bit. As this is going on, the camera cuts to show a man walking through the trees. It's hard to make out his face because of the low light, but as viewers we can assume he's not part of the ritual the girls are doing. Speaking of the ritual, Tichuba has stopped spinning the chicken around and now she's chanting in some foreign language. The closed captions for the movie even just call this, quote, chanting in foreign language, <laughs> end quote. This chant almost sounds like a song and the girls start swaying back and forth as Tichuba chants. At this point is when we get confirmation of what you probably assumed was the purpose of this whole ritual. One of the girls says, Make a spell on Joseph Baker, Tichuba. Make him love me. Another calls out, Make Daniel Poole my husband. Then one of the girls asks Abigail who she wants. Without saying anything herself, another girl answers the question for Abigail. She wants John Proctor. Get her John Proctor. At this point, Abigail takes things to the next level. She whispers something in Tichuba's ear. And then Tichuba immediately begs Abigail not to do whatever it was that she said. That is a bad thing. We don't have to wait long to find out what it is. Abigail takes the dead chicken and swings it over her head, then brings it crashing to the ground. We can hear the sound of bones cracking as the chicken hits the rocks surrounding the fire on the ground. Abigail wipes the chicken's blood on her mouth, presumably drinking some of it in the process. The girls all start screaming and laughing and even tearing off their clothes. In the forest, we can see the man again. He's close enough now to see the ritual the girls are performing. He's also close enough to get a better look at the man's face. And even though the movie doesn't mention his name here, we can tell that this is Bruce Davison's character, Reverend Samuel Paris. Seeing the Reverend, the girls all scatter. Reverend Paris looks into the pot, but it's impossible to see what's inside because of the steam. He pulls out the ladle. A dead frog is on the end of it. Revolted, the Reverend drops the utensil back into the pot. In the background, we can see there's only two girls left by the fire. One is Abigail, and another is the girl that she left the house with earlier. The other girl is screaming something to the effect of, I can't move. In the next scene, we're back at Reverend Paris's home. It's daytime now. Abigail is in the room with the girl who was screaming that she couldn't move. It's here that we first hear her name, Betty. It's also here that we find out Something is wrong with Betty. She's asleep, and she won't wake up. This whole opening sequence of the love spell ritual in the forest outside of Salem is, well, to be honest, we don't know if it's true or not. But it's probably not. You see, there's a lot about the Salem witch trials that we know. But there's also so much about the events surrounding the story that we just don't know. With that said, what we do know of the events leading up to the Salem Witch Trials, the evidence suggests that it was not because of a love spell ritual being conducted in secret in the forest like we see in the opening scenes of the movie. At least, not really. We haven't come across him yet in the movie, but one of the real people who was there during the Salem Witch Trials was a man by the name of John Hale. He's called Reverend John Hale in the movie, and he's played by Rob Campbell. The reason I mention John Hale now is because he wrote a book called A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft and How Persons Guilty of That Crime May Be Convicted, and the means used for their discovery discussed both negatively and affirmatively according to scripture and experience. <laughs> That's a pretty descriptive title. He gives himself the title of pastor, by the way, in that book. Not much of a difference in the eyes of a lot of people, but there is one 
slight difference, since a reverend usually refers to someone in the clergy, while a pastor is a more loose term for the minister leading a church. But since all the ministers are called reverends in the movie, that's what I'll call John Hale throughout this episode, too. Now, Reverend Hale's book was published in 1697, about five years after the events in the movie. I'll include a link to where you can find the full text of the book over on the page for this episode at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. This is a quote from Reverend Hale's book where he gives us a clue as to what might have been at the start of it all. I fear some young persons through a vain curiosity to know their future condition have tampered with the devil's tools, so far that hereby one door was opened to Satan to play those pranks. I knew one of the afflicted persons who, as I was credibly informed, did try with an egg and a glass to find her future husband's calling, till there came up a coffin, that is, a specter in likeness of a coffin. And she was afterward followed with diabolical molestation to her death, and so died a single person. A just warning to others to take heed of handling the devil's weapons, lest they get a wound thereby. Another I was called to pray with, being under sore fits and vexations of Satan. And upon examination I found she had tried the same charm, And after her confession of it and manifestation of repentance for it, and our prayers to God for her, she was speedily released from those bonds of Satan. This iniquity, though I take it not to be the capital crime condemned, Exodus 22, because such persons act ignorantly, not considering they hereby go to the devil, yet borders very much upon it and is too like Saul's going to the witch at Endor, and Ahaziah sending to the god of Ekron to inquire. Did you catch the mention of the charm? Reverend Hale mentioned, one of the girls tried to use an egg and a glass to try to find her future husband's calling. Instead, she found a specter in the form of a coffin. Maybe not necessarily the first time, but that was what scared her. Then he says he discovered another of the girls tried the same charm. So what exactly does that mean? What Reverend Hale is referring to is something known as umancy, or sometimes referred to as a Venus glass. It was thought to have been something kind of like a crystal ball, something that someone used to tell one's future. Remember that scene in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban where Harry is in Professor Trelawney's divination class and he sees the tea leaves at the bottom of his cup reveal the grim? Well, that's basically what this charm was, except instead of tea leaves, they used an egg. The basic concept of this method of divination is to provide some sort of heat and drop an egg onto it. Then you read the shape the egg white takes when it starts to solidify. As Hale mentioned, the girls seem to have been using this as a way of telling who their future husbands might be. As the story goes, the two girls who started playing with this form of divination might very well have been Abigail Williams and Betty Paris. And then they got scared when the egg white revealed the shape of a coffin, presumably predicting some horrible fate, almost exactly like the Grimm in Harry Potter. So it's not likely that they were performing a love spell ritual, dancing around a fire in the forest like we see in the movie. Instead, they were using eggs as a form of divination. Think about that the next time you crack an egg over your pan. The shape you see when the egg whites hit the heated pan was one of the ingredients that went into the Salem Witch Trials hysteria. On the other side of that, Reverend Hale's words also give us a peek into the mindset of Christianity of the day, as he mentions the charm being the bonds of Satan. In fact, Reverend Hale's book opens with a scripture verse from Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. 
when they say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, to the law and to the testimony, and if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Earlier, when I was quoting from Reverend Hale's book, he actually mentions a witch, and that witch that he mentions is also from the Bible, the witch of Endor. That comes from 1 Samuel 28, verses 6 through 8, when the first king of Israel, Saul, sought out the counsel of a witch in the city of Endor. He asks the witch to, quote, Divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee, End quote. As that story goes, King Saul asked for the spirit of his old mentor and prophet of God, Samuel. But things didn't turn out so well when the spirit of Samuel prophesied the Israelites would be defeated by the Philistines the very next day. And so, you can start to get an idea for why the Christians in Salem could see this as an example of cause and effect. Essentially, there are dire consequences for getting help from a witch. There's a long list of other Bible verses that speak to the evils of witchcraft, Leviticus 19.26b says, quote, You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes, end quote. 1 Samuel 15.23a says, quote, For rebellion is as the sin of divination, end quote. And 1 Chronicles 10.13-14 says, quote, So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. End quote. There's more, but the last one I'll reference comes from Leviticus 20, verse 27. Quote, a man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. End quote. For the purpose of our story today, that sort of biblical story is exactly why the Christian leaders in Salem would have forbade any sort of contact with witchcraft. Even something like using eggs for divination would have been seen as the work of the devil. And the penalty, well, it's not good. Going back to the movie, after the ritual in the forest, we find out that Betty Paris isn't waking up. Reverend Paris tells Abigail to go get the doctor. So she goes to get the doctor. Knocking on the door, a Mrs. Griggs answers. Abigail asks for the doctor because Betty won't wake up. She's puzzled. Mrs. Griggs, that is. She tells Abigail the doctor isn't in. He's at the Putnam house because Ruth Putnam won't wake up either. After this, the scene cuts to a girl in bed staring at the camera. Dr. Griggs waves his hand over her eyes, but they don't move. They don't blink. Dr. Griggs goes on to inform the others in the room that he's never seen anything like this. There's no fever, no wound, and yet she sleeps. The others in the room are the girl's parents, Thomas and Ann Putnam, as well as Reverend Paris. In the background, we can also see Abigail Williams is there too, as is Mercy Lewis. When Reverend Paris tells the doctor about his Betty being the same, the doctor is surprised. Anne jumps to an answer. It's the devil, isn't it? Dr. Griggs isn't so quick to jump to that conclusion. He simply says that this may be a sickness beyond his skill. But then, in the next scene, we see Thomas Putnam walking and talking to Reverend Paris. Thomas, too, seems convinced this is witchcraft. Paris begs Thomas not to jump to witchcraft that quickly. Thomas insists that Reverend Paris must admit that it is witchcraft. Paris replies by saying he needs time to think. That's not really what happened. Of course, we'll never know the exact conversations that took place or the thoughts, beliefs, and fears of the people in Salem in 1692, but as best as we can tell from what really happened, it was that Abigail Williams and Betty Paris started having 
uncontrollable fits. He's not in the movie at all, but another spiritual leader in the community was Reverend Diodat Lawson, and he wrote about what he saw. This is a quote from his book published in 1692 called A Brief and True Narrative of Some Remarkable Passages Relating to Sundry Persons Afflicted by Witchcraft in Salem Village, which happened from the 19th of March to the 5th of April, 1692. (laughs) That was just the title of the book. So you can probably tell how brief (laughs) the uh, actual book is. It's also worth mentioning that despite the title of Lawson's book, Abigail Williams and Betty Paris started throwing fits in either January or February of 1692. And then a little later, Lawson recounted seeing one of those fits. So we'll get a peek into what one of those fits was like with this quote from Reverend Lawson's experience. On the 19th day of March last, I went to Salem Village and lodged at Nathaniel Ingersoll's near to the Minister P. House, and presently after I came into my lodging, Captain Whalen's daughter Mary came to Lieutenant Ingersoll's and spake to me. But suddenly, after as she stood by the door, was bitten, so that she cried out of her wrist, and looking on it with a candle, we saw, apparently, the marks of teeth, both upper and lower set on each side of her wrist. In the beginning of the evening, I went to give Mr. P. a visit. When I was there, his kinswoman, Abigail Williams, about twelve years of age, had a grievous fit. She was at first hurried with violence to and fro in the room, though Mrs. Ingersoll endeavored to hold her, sometimes making as if she would fly, stretching up her arms as high as she could and crying, Wish! 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 several times. Presently after, she said there was goodwife N, and said, Do you not see her? Why, there she stands. And she said goodwife N offered her the book. But she was resolved she would not take it, saying, Often, I won't, I won't, I won't take it. I do not know what book it is. I am sure it is none of God's book. It is the devil's book, for aught I know. After that, she run to the fire and begun to throw firebrands about the house, and run against the back, as if she would run up chimney, and, as they said, she had attempted to go into the fire, in other fits. The minister, Mr. P., mentioned is Reverend Paris, and I'm assuming the good wife N. mentioned is Rebecca Nurse, but I couldn't find anything to confirm that. From Reverend Lawson's account, we not only get a sense for what one of Abigail's fits was like, But we also get an idea for how she named others. The mention of Goodwife M. Do you not see her? Why, there she stands. One thing the movie got right, though, was that Abigail was living in the Paris house because her own parents had been killed. Reverend Paris was Abigail's uncle, making the Reverend's daughter, Elizabeth, or Betty in the movie, Abigail's cousin. When the real Dr. Griggs examined Abigail to try to figure out what was causing these fits, he couldn't find anything wrong with her. Since these came after it was discovered she was using divination, it didn't take long for the idea that this was all witchcraft to enter the picture. Abigail wasn't the only one having these fits either. Here's another excerpt from Reverend Lawson's book that explains how it spread. If you recall, the last excerpt mentions the 19th of March. This is from two days later, on Monday, the 21st. The number of afflicted persons were about that time 10, namely four married women, Mrs. Pope, Mrs. Putnam, Goodwife Weber, and an ancient woman named Goodall, three maids, Mary Walcott, Mercy Lewis at Thomas Putnam's, and a maid at Dr. Griggs's, There were three girls from nine to twelve years of age, each of them, or thereabouts, namely Elizabeth Paris, Abigail Williams, and Anne Putnam. These were most of them at examination, and did vehemently accuse her in the assembly of afflicting them by biting, pinching, strangling, etc. You'll notice the mention of Mrs. Putnam being afflicted. That's not something we see in the movie. Speaking of which, going back to the movie, we quickly find out one of the key drivers for Winona Ryder's version of Abigail Williams. 
That happens when we see Daniel Day-Lewis's character, John Proctor. He's called into town to attend a town meeting in which Reverend Paris mentions he's called for Reverend John Hale from Beverly. As a quick side note, the town of Beverly is only about 2.5 miles away, or about 4 kilometers to the north of Salem. According to the movie, Abigail Williams used to work for John Proctor and his wife Elizabeth. The movie goes even further to say that Abigail and John had an affair, and it was this affair that was the ultimate reason why Elizabeth Proctor fired Abigail and forced her to leave their house. In fact, that is a very major plot point in the movie that runs throughout the entire movie. And it's one that is entirely made up. Although John and Elizabeth Proctor were real people, there's no evidence to suggest that John Proctor had an affair with Abigail Williams. And that brings up something else the movie changed to make this affair much more plausible. Their ages. Even though I don't know for certain the exact dates when they shot the movie, we know Winona Ryder was born in 1971 and the movie was released in 1996, 25 years later. So, Winona Ryder would have been in her 20s when she played the part of Abigail Williams. On the other side of the affair we see in the movie is John Proctor. He's played by Daniel Day-Lewis, who was in his mid-40s during the shooting of the movie. That makes it an affair between a 20-something Winona Ryder's Abigail Williams and a 40-something Daniel Day-Lewis's John Proctor. In truth, Abigail Williams was not quite 12 years old. And John Proctor was almost 60 years old when this all happened. You might have caught that mention of Abigail's age in Reverend Lawson's description of her fit. He said Abigail was about 12 years old. In fact, at that point, she was 11. Abigail was born on July 12, 1680, and since the fit Reverend Lawson mentioned happened on March 19, 1692, that means Abigail would have been 11 years, 8 months, and 7 days old. And since John Proctor was born on March 30th, 1632, that would make him 59 years, 11 months, and 20 days old on the account from Reverend Lawson on March 19th, 1692. Well, the age difference alone is not proof enough that there was not an affair between John and Abigail. As I mentioned a moment ago, there just doesn't seem to be any evidence to suggest the two had an affair. Since the romance between John and Abigail is a major part of the movie's storyline, that can give you an idea for how accurate the rest of the movie is. In fact, many historians believe that the first time Abigail even met John was at the trials. If that's true, that would mean Abigail accused him of witchcraft without even knowing who he really was. Speaking of accusations, if we head back to the movie's timeline, the accusations begin. We see it happen when Reverend Hale arrives in town. After Reverend Paris tells Hale about the dancing he saw in the forest, Hale is shocked to find they allow dancing. But don't worry, Paris tells Hale, they don't allow dancing, t'was secret. As a little side note, it is true that early American Puritans were against dancing, although some historians might be quick to point out that they didn't believe it to be so evil like the movie seems to imply. They merely believed it was suggestive and they were against anything of a sexual theme. So if they did dance, it would be at an arm's length. In the movie, though, as Reverend Hale is trying to get to the bottom of what went on in the forest, he quickly starts to suspect something evil as Paris tells him about the boiling pot. Hale gathers up all the girls and tries to get them to tell him what was going on as they danced around the fire in the forest. Were they casting spells? Did they drink from the pot? One of the girls points at Winona Ryder's version of Abigail Williams, who quickly denies everything. Instead, she passes the blame and says it was all Tituba's idea. The scene cuts to Tituba's place, and the men grab her to interrogate. Abigail is there and continues to point fingers at Tituba. She did this. She made me drink blood. Reverend Paris whips Tituba as they try to get the truth out of her. When they say they'll hang her, Tichiba confesses to being a witch. As viewers, it's clear the choice Tichiba had wasn't really much of a choice at all. Confess to being a witch or we'll hang you. What would you do in that situation? 
And while the movie is highly dramatized in how this all went down, there are some kernels of truth in there. It is true that a slave named Tichuba was one of the first accused. The charge against her was afflicting four girls, Abigail Williams, Betty Paris, Ann Putnam Jr., and Elizabeth Hubbard. Sort of like we heard from Reverend Lawson's account, the girls were throwing fits and claiming that they were being pinched, bitten, or strangled by invisible spirits, and they claimed Tichuba was one of those spirits. Tichuba, in turn, blamed two other women in town, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. Like the movie shows, Sarah Good was a homeless woman who had earned a bad reputation in town for begging for food and shelter from people. So no one thought twice when she was accused of witchcraft. It made sense to them. Sarah Osborne also had a poor reputation in town. It was not for being homeless, but instead, Sarah Osborne's bad reputation came from her marrying one of her servants. Oh, and she also didn't go to church as much as people thought that she should. As for Tichuba, well, she was a South American Indian and Reverend Paris's slave. Race and cultural differences certainly played a part in her accusation. Ultimately, no one was surprised when these three were accused of witchcraft. No one defended them. They were different. As a result, it was Tichuba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne that were the first three people arrested in what we now know as the Salem Witch Trials. Back in the movie, we see there are more accused. A court is set up to get to the bottom of this. According to the movie, there are three judges, Judge Danforth, Judge Hawthorne, and Judge Sewell. There's a montage of sorts as we see Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne arrested. Soon after is someone named Mary Sibber. She was upset that someone's goat was in her garden and because she yelled, devil take you all, apparently that was enough reason for her to get locked up. Then there's another woman and her daughter, The movie doesn't give us their name, we just see them as they happen to be nearby when a cart passes and breaks down. They must be witches, so they're accused. Mr. Jacobs is next. We see a scene where Thomas Putnam is arguing with Jacob Proctor over the borders of their land, which butts up against each other. As Thomas is leaving, he sees Mr. Jacobs. In the next scene, Mr. Jacobs is accused in front of the court. Ruth Paris, Thomas's daughter, claims that Mr. Jacobs snuck through her window. The elderly Mr. Jacobs laughs at this. Raising the two sticks in his hands, he points out to the three judges that he has to walk with two sticks. How am I supposed to get through a window? Judge Hawthorne insists that Mr. Jacobs could have sent his spirit through the window. Mr. Jacobs is befuddled. How do you do that? As Mr. Jacobs is talking, Ruth Paris gets close to one of the judges and whispers something to him. She claims she sees a black man on Mr. Jacobs' shoulder, whispering to him. Almost immediately, the other girls, Abigail Williams and so on, start saying the same thing. They see the same spirit on Mr. Jacobs' shoulder. Mr. Jacobs is sentenced to be hanged. What we see here in the movie with this court and the three judges is quite disturbing. Do the judges already have an idea that these accused are all guilty? We see it almost right away when Judge Hawthorne suggests that the elderly Mr. Jacobs' spirit might have gone through Ruth Paris's window. The only one the movie seems to imply might be concerned over what's going on is Judge Sewell. At one point, he mentions to Judge Danforth that he didn't expect all their evidence of witchery to come from children. Danforth tells Sewell to remember the gospel, quote, from the mouths of babes shall come the truth, end quote. It's almost as if the judges are trying to prove the accusations are correct. They're hardly impartial. All of that is, well, it's a movie, so it's never going to be entirely true. <laughs> but there are some key elements in there that the movie got right. Although it's interesting that Danforth in the movie quotes From the mouths of babes shall come the truth, and then implies that it comes from the Gospels. That would be the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And while the, quote, mouths of babes, end quote, saying is a common one, that direct quote is not from the Gospels. The closest scripture from the four Gospels is Matthew 21, 16, which says, quote, And they said to him, 
Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? End quote. That scripture, of course, implies that the saying existed before Jesus said it. And it did. For example, while the Gospels are in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, there's another scripture, Psalms 8-2, which says, quote, Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, and to the enemy and the avenger, end quote. But, Judge Danforth's apparent misquoting of scripture aside, the movie is correct in showing him there. Same with Judge Hawthorne, whose first name was John. He was also there. So was Samuel Sewell. The movie implies those were the only three judges the entire time, Danforth, Sewell, and Hawthorne. That is not correct. It's really a simplification. The truth is a little more complex, and it also gives us another glimpse into the overall historical accuracy of the movie. The real Thomas Danforth came to the New World in 1634 from England to escape persecution of his Puritan beliefs. Ironic. He was also known to be very conservative, and by the time 1692 rolled around, he was the acting governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay. He was acting because in 1688, there was what we now know as the Glorious Revolution. Basically, a bunch of Puritan leaders revolted against King James II and established a governor over a new land they called the Dominion of New England. After the Glorious Revolution, the Dominion of New England collapsed, and the province of Massachusetts Bay was reestablished with Thomas Danforth as the governor. So, it was Thomas Danforth who was essentially the man in charge when this all started happening in Salem in the early months of 1692. So the movie got that right. But the movie shows Thomas Danforth there in Salem for the entire duration, and that is not right. Danforth's involvement in the trials ended in May of 1692, so he was only there for a few months. The others presiding over the trials for the beginning months of 1692 alongside Thomas Danforth were John Hawthorne, Jonathan Corwin, who is also listed as a sheriff sometimes, and Bartholomew Gedney. Those last two weren't even in the movie. But then all that changed in May. As I just mentioned, Danforth left. And the reason for that had to do with the Glorious Rebellion of 1688 that I mentioned earlier. It all ties in. More specifically, it had to do with Thomas Danforth not really being a fan of King James II, So it was only a matter of time, once the English colony was reestablished, that he was replaced. And that replacement arrived from England in May of 1692. The new governor's name was William Phipps. And when he arrived, he set up a new court with some new people. For the purposes of our story today, essentially Thomas Danforth was the only one who was replaced from the panel of judges. I'm sure it was no coincidence that Danforth was the one who was most outspoken against King James II either. Replacing Danforth's position as heading up the trials at Salem was a new chief magistrate, a man by the name of William Stoughton. He was the lieutenant governor beneath William Phipps. As you could probably guess, Stoughton also was not in the movie at all. But then again, neither were most of the other judges that came with the change in leadership in May of 1692. The three judges who were in the court alongside Thomas Danforth stayed on. That would be Jonathan Corwin, Bartholomew Gedney, and the other one that we do see in the movie, John Hawthorne. And right now you might be wondering, but wait a minute, what about Judge Samuel Sewell? He was in the movie. Yes, he was, but he wasn't a part of the trials under Thomas Danforth. He joined in May of 1692, as did Nathaniel Saltonstall, Peter Sargent, and Wait still, Winthrop. Whew. Okay. So, rounding all that up, basically, the movie shows three judges, for simplicity, Danforth, Sewell, and Hawthorne. In reality, Danforth and Hawthorne were there at the beginning of the trials alongside two other judges that weren't in the movie. And and then in May of 1692, Hawthorne and those other judges stayed on while Danforth left. That's also when Samuel Sewell and five others joined the court. And that doesn't even count some of the other little changes that happened. 
For example, how Nathaniel Stoltenstall joined in May, but then resigned in June. Or others like Thomas Newton and Anthony Checkley, who were the lawyers on the side of the crown. I can start to see why the movie simplified things. <laughs> With all that said, in the movie, we see Thomas Danforth and John Hawthorne seem to be the primary drivers behind believing the girls, while Samuel Sewell goes along with it, but he isn't so sure. Again, this is an oversimplification. You might think that just because the movie's incorrect in showing Thomas Danforth being there the whole time, that perhaps his replacement, William Stoughton, might be better. That's not necessarily true. At least, not as far as the fate of those accused. For example, in June of 1692, Rebecca Nurse was one of the women accused of witchcraft. We see that in the movie. What we don't see is that her trial ended with the jury declaring her not guilty. It was Chief Magistrate William Stoughton who bowed to the public outcry and requested the jury review the case again. This time they found her guilty, and on July 19, 1692, Rebecca was sentenced to death. As for John Hawthorne, he's portrayed in the movie as someone who seems to buy into the belief that they're witches from the beginning. There's one scene in particular when Robert Bueller's version of Judge Hawthorne is questioning Martha Corey. He asks Martha if she's a witch. She says she's not a witch. Then she says she doesn't even know what a witch is. If you don't know what a witch is, how do you know you are not one? Judge Hawthorne says in a smug response. While the overall idea that Judge Hawthorne seemingly already had the accused guilt in mind like we see in the movie is not accurate, that particular exchange was one that really happened. It's probably the most popular exchange for Judge Hawthorne, although it's not with Martha Corey like we see in the movie. It was with another accused, Bridget Bishop. But Bridget Bishop is not even in the movie, so maybe that's why they changed it. Oh, and like a lot of other things we've looked at so far, the movie's version is simplified. And we know that because we have the original transcripts. This comes from a book called Record of Salem Witchcraft, copied from the original documents, Volume 1, by W. Elliot Woodward, and published in 1864. Of course, I'll include a link to where you can read the entire book for free online on the page for this episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. But for the sake of this back and forth, I'll save you the trouble of reading it. Now, unfortunately, the transcript doesn't really mention who is saying what, but hopefully you can figure out who is Judge Hawthorne and who is Bridget Bishop just from what's being said. For the most part, it's pretty clear, and it gives you a sense of what it must have been like in that courtroom with the afflicted girls seemingly being affected by Bridget. The Examination of Bridget Bishop at Salem Village, 19 April, 1692, by John Hawthorne and Jonathan Corwin, Esquire. As soon as she came, near all fell into fits. Bridget Bishop, you are now brought before authority to give account of what witchcrafts you are conversant in. I take all this people, turning her head and eyes about, to witness that I am clear. Hath this woman hurt you, speaking to ye afflicted? Elizabeth Hubbard, Ann Putnam, Abigail Williams, and Mercy Lewis affirmed that she had hurt them. You are here accused by four or five for hurting them, what do you say to it? I never saw these persons before, nor I never was in this place before. Mary Walcott said that her brother Jonathan stroke her appearance, and she saw that he had tore her coat in striking, and she heard a tear. Upon some search in the court, a rent that seems to answer what was alleged was found. They say you bewitch your first husband to death. If it please your worship... I know nothing of it. She shakes her head, and the afflicted were tortured, the like again upon the motion of her head. Sam Braybook affirmed that she told him today that she had been accounted a witch these ten years, but she was no witch, the devil cannot hurt her. I am no witch. Why have you not wrote in the book, yet tell me how far you have gone? I have no familiarity with the devil. 
How is it then that your appearance doth hurt these? I am innocent. Why you seem to act witchcraft before us by the motion of your body which seems to have influence upon the afflicted? I know nothing of it. I am innocent to a witch. I know not what a witch is. How do you know then that you are not a witch? I do not know what you say. How can you know you are no witch, and yet not know what a witch is? I am clear. If I were any such person, you should know it. You may threaten, but you can do no more than you are permitted. I am innocent of a witch. What do you say of those murders you are charged with? I hope I am not guilty of murder. Then she turned up her eyes, and the eyes of the afflicted were turned up, It may be you do not know that any have confessed today who have been examined before you that they are witches. No, I know nothing of it. John Hutchinson and John Lewis in open court affirmed that they had told her. Why look you, you are taken now in a flat liar. I did not hear them. Note. Same Goldfaith that after this examination, he asked Bridget Bishop if she were not troubled to see the afflicted persons so tormented. Said Bishop answered, no, she was not troubled for them. Then he asked her whether she thought they were bewitched. She said she could not tell what to think about them. Will Good and John Buxton, Junt was by and he supposed they heard her also. Mr. Sam Paris being desired to take in writing the examination of Bridget Bishop, hath delivered it as aforesaid. And upon hearing ye same and seeing what we did, then we see together with the charge of the afflicted persons then present, we committed said Bridget Oliver. Signed, John Hawthorne. That's just the first examination of Bridget Bishop. It continues with another round by John Hawthorne and Jonathan Curran, and beyond. Again, if you haven't yet, then go check out the original transcripts. It'll give you a good idea of what was being said in the back and forth. And if you picture the scene sort of like what we see in the movie, even though what's being said is different, you can also imagine the group of afflicted girls repeating what the accused does. Like when the transcript said Bridget shakes her head and the afflicted were tortured. As the movie comes to a close, we see the affair between John Porter and Abigail Williams come out in the open. Elizabeth Proctor is called to testify, but she doesn't know John has already confessed to the affair. So she lies about it. She thinks she's saving her husband. Instead, the opposite is true. Of course, we already know that's all made up. As I mentioned earlier, there's no evidence of an affair between John Proctor and Abigail Williams. But the final sequence we see Winona Ryder's version of Abigail Williams in is when she flees Salem. She steals money from her uncle and disappears. The movie implies she took a ship somewhere. Then, back in Salem, John Proctor at first signs a confession. Then he takes it back. He can't bring himself to confess, even if it costs his life. The last scene we see is Daniel Day-Lewis's version of John Proctor on the gallows alongside Mary Pat Gleason's version of Martha Corey and Elizabeth Lawrence's version of Rebecca Nurse. It's Rebecca who starts quoting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Martha and John continue the prayer with Rebecca. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. The camera cuts to the crowd watching the hanging. Earlier, when we saw people being hanged, the crowd was cheering and joyful at the deaths. This time, they're not. They're looking on in shock at the scene unfolding in front of them. The prayer continues, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The camera zooms in on John Proctor. At this point, we hear a noise. If you have the closed captions turned on, then you'd see the movie tell us what that noise was. Neck snaps. 
there are only two voices now. John continues, raising his voice, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Another noise. John's voice is alone now. Forever and ever. John's face drops from the camera's view. Another noise. And just like most of this movie, there are parts of that that are true, kernels of truth. There are parts of it that are not, and there are parts of it that we just don't know. Let's start with Abigail Williams. She falls in, we just don't know. The reason for that is because everything we do know about all this comes from the written records that have survived. And after the trials, there simply are no written records that mention Abigail Williams. She seems to just disappear. Did she steal money from her uncle and run away like the movie implies? Maybe. There are some stories that suggest she did exactly that. There are other stories that say she died just five years later after the trials in 1697 at the age of 17. In the end, we just don't know, and we probably never will. That brings us to the death of John Proctor. That is true, but it didn't happen the way the movie shows. Probably the closest part that the movie got right was that Abigail Williams accused John's wife, Elizabeth, And then it was because John defended Elizabeth that the accusations turned to him, too. One tidbit I thought was interesting the movie got wrong had to do with John's confession. When we see Daniel Day-Lewis' version of John Proctor sign the confession, if you pause the movie, you can see at the top the paper says, Confession of John Proctor on this 14th day of November 1692. The real John Proctor was executed on August 19th, 1692. Unlike what we see in the movie, Martha Corey did not die along John that day. She was executed on September 22nd, 1692. Rebecca Nurse also was not there that same day. She was executed before John and Martha on July 19th, 1692. At the very end of the movie, we get some text on screen that tells us the Salem witch hunt ended after 19 executions. The reason it ended, at least according to the movie, was because more and more accused people refused to save themselves by giving false confessions, just like we see John Proctor refused to do in the movie. That number is true. There were over 200 people who were accused of witchcraft, but not everyone who was accused was arrested. About 150 of them were, though. In the end, a total of 14 women and 5 men were found guilty and executed between February of 1692 and May of 1693. Lest we forget, here are the names of the 19 people in the order of their execution. Bridget Bishop, June 10, 1692. Sarah Good, July 19th, 1692. Elizabeth Howe, July 19th, 1692. Susanna Martin, July 19th, 1692. Rebecca Nurse, July 19th, 1692. Sarah Wilds, July 19th, 1692. Reverend George Burroughs, the only reverend, executed. August 19th, 1692. Martha Carrier, August 19th, 1692. John Willard, August 19th, 1692. George Jacobs Sr., August 19th, 1692. John Proctor, August 19th, 1692. Alice Parker, September 22nd, 1692. Mary Parker, September 22nd, 1692. Anne Pudiator, September 22nd, 1692. Wilmot Red, September 22nd, 1692. Margaret Scott, September 22nd, 1692. Samuel Wardwell, September 22nd, 1692. Martha Corey, September 22nd, 1692. Mary Eastie, 
September 22, 1692. That number, those 19, does not include the 20th victim. That would be Giles Corey, who is often listed separately because the movie correctly showed he was executed by pressing or being crushed to death by stones. Although his execution didn't really have to do with refusing to say someone's name like the movie implies. Instead, he was accused of witchcraft like his wife, Martha. And Giles was the only person who was accused who refused to enter any sort of a plea at all. He would not say that he was guilty, and he would not say that he was innocent. So they tortured him by pressing because he refused to give a plea. That torture went on for three days before Giles died, just three days before his wife Martha would be executed by hanging. That number also does not include another four or five people who died while they were imprisoned during the trials, most likely due to illness or some other reason that happens when you're imprisoned in 17th century Massachusetts. The text at the end of the movie implies that the trials ended because so many people refused to confess. While it is true that a lot of people refused to confess, after all, lying was a sin too, the real driver behind the end of the witch trials was in September of 1692 when spectral evidence was declared inadmissible in court. Since most of the evidence up until that point had been based on the dreams and visions of those who had made accusations, the remaining people in custody ended up being found not guilty. The hangings on September 22, 1692 were the final executions of the Salem witch trials. In the last few months of the trials, there were a few more warrants for execution, but Governor William Phipps stepped in and pardoned them. Others were found not guilty and eventually released. The trials officially ended in May of 1693 when the final prisoners were released, a little over a year since the first of the trials began in February of 1692. In the centuries since, countless people have tried to figure out the cause for the trials. Some have suggested it was a fabrication by greedy landowners. Those who suggest this theory point to a feud between the Putnam family and the Proctor family that had been going on for a while before the witch trials. There were others in the community who had similar disagreements going on that caused accusations. We saw a hint at this when we saw Thomas Putnam try to take over Mr. Jacobs' land in the movie. Others say it was a case of mass hysteria that started when Puritan beliefs collided with those in the community deemed to be outside the church and looked down upon. Some of those at the heart of the trials apologized. Judge Samuel Sewell, for example, issued an apology on January 15, 1697, the same day that Governor Stoughton declared a day of official humiliation as the entire community prayed and fasted and asked God for forgiveness for what they'd done. Five years later, the general court in Massachusetts officially declared the trials were unlawful. In an ironic twist, one of the girls who had thrown accusations around later claimed that she had been taken over by the devil to do what she had done. Thirteen years after the trials ended, in 1706, Anne Putnam Jr. apologized for her actions by saying, I desire to be humbled before God for that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family in the year about 92, that I, then being in my childhood, should, by such a providence of God, be made an instrument for the accusing of several people for grievous crimes, whereby their lives was taken away from them, whom, now, I have just grounds and good reason to believe they were innocent persons, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time. Five years later, in 1711, a bill was passed that officially restored the good names and rights of those who had been accused. Their heirs were also given 600 pounds for restitution. It's really tough to convert currency like that, especially since the United States wasn't even a thing back then. But as best as I can tell, that 600 pounds in 1711 would be roughly the same as about 92,000 in today's U.S. dollars. Then, for hundreds of years, much of the world forgot about the Salem Witch Trials. It wasn't until Arthur Miller's play that the movie was based on, also called The Crucible, 
When that was released in 1953, the trials were once again given the spotlight of the world. Four years after the Crucible hit the stage in 1957, the state of Massachusetts officially and formally apologized for the events that took place in 1692. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. Wow, I, I feel like we're only scratching the surface here. We didn't get to talk about the fact that even though the name Salem Witch Trials implies everything happened in Salem, the accusations spilled over into nearby towns. Or there was the 1976 study by Linda Caporal who found that the likely culprit for the fits that might have started it all was something called ergo, a type of fungus that can contaminate foods and cause muscle spasms, vomiting, and hallucinations. Of course, we'll never know for sure. But that could be one explanation for how it started, at least. Then there's the land disputes angle. Even if it started with the girls' fits, most historians agree that there were some who used the witch trials as a way of accusing those that they wanted out of the picture for one reason or another. That alone could be an entire podcast in and of itself. And of course, you can't forget about the religious side of it all. Those who were accused of witchcraft found themselves with an impossible choice. On one hand, you were faced with being executed for the sin of working with the devil. After the trials began, it didn't take long for those accused to realize that confessing you were in league with the devil would at least save you from being hanged. After all, in the list of those executed, you don't see names like Tichuba, one of the first people accused. Some people saved themselves from execution by confessing. Of course, confessing was also a lie. Lying is a sin, and God will judge you for that sin. That's why, in the movie, you hear a lot of references to that, the idea that God will judge you for your lies. Something the movie doesn't talk about is the Puritan belief of predestination. Basically, the idea that God has already decided if you're going to go to heaven or hell. The catch is, you have no idea which bucket you fall into. So if you lie, then you would risk the chance that you were in the heaven bucket. In a nutshell... Once you were accused, you were faced with dying with your honor and a possible heavenly future, or you could give up that chance at heaven with the sin of lying and confess to something you didn't do. If you want to learn more about the Salem Witch Trials, there's a ton of great resources out there. I would recommend you start with, well, reading the documents, the source documents themselves. I mentioned a few of them throughout this episode. <laughs> you know, the books with really long titles, <laughs> like... A brief and true narration of some remarkable passages relating to sundry persons afflicted by witchcraft in Salem Village, which happened from the 19th of March to the 5th of April, 1692. It's one of the books. Or, A modest inquiry into the nature of witchcraft and how persons guilty of that crime may be convicted and the means used for their discovery discussed both negatively and affirmatively according to scripture and experience. <laughs> That's another book. Or there's the transcripts from the court records published in the 1860s under the title of Record of Salem Witchcraft, copied from the original documents. That one has multiple volumes. Between all that, you've got a ton of reading you can do from the original documents, reports, and firsthand accounts of people who were there. Because of their age, those are all available for free online, and they were my primary sources for this episode. But there are some other sources used for this episode, including History.com, HistoryOfMassachusetts.org, Smithsonian.com, and ThoughtCo.com. I'll have a link to those books, those resources, plenty more resources over on the page for this episode at BasedOnATrueStoryPodcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one. John Proctor was executed alongside Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse. Number two, more than 19 people were executed during the Salem Witch Trials. Number three, Abigail Williams never had an affair with John Proctor. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number two. More than 19 people were executed during the Salem Witch Trials. That is true. As we learned, there were 19 people who were executed by hanging, and another, Giles Corey, who was executed by pressing. That brings the total to 20 people executed. 
But then I guess there's those who died in prison after being arrested. Those numbers actually vary depending on the source. Some say four or five. Others put the number who died in prison as high as 13 or 14. And that brings us to number one. John Proctor was executed alongside Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse. That's the lie. As we learned, Rebecca Nurse was executed by hanging on July 19th, John Proctor exactly one month later on August 19th, and Martha Corey on September 22nd. Finally, we come to number three. Abigail Williams never had an affair with John Proctor. That is true, although I suppose you could say that anything is possible. After all, Abigail Williams is one of those historical figures we just know very little about before her name enters the public record during the trials, and then it just disappears afterwards. I'm going to call this one true, though, because as we learned, there's no evidence that Abigail Williams even met John Proctor before the trials, and then there's the age difference. Abigail Williams wasn't even a teenager when the trials began, while John Proctor was 60 at the time of his execution. Okay, before wrapping things up, I want to switch gears here for a moment, because recently I got a great email from a listener about the true story behind the movie The Right Stuff. We covered that on episode number 75 of Based on a True Story. And I'll just read the email. Here is the email from Don. Hi, Dan. I happened across your podcast about the movie The Right Stuff. I was impressed with the effort you put into researching the movie and the history behind it, but wanted to point out what I believe is an unfair and inaccurate bit of Wolf's book and the movie that has become part of of the Chuck Yeager mythos. Chalmers, Slick, Goodland, the Bell pilot who was replaced by Yeager, did not demand a huge bonus and threaten not to fly like some modern-day NFL diva as Wolf depicts at the start of the book. Goodland had inherited the test pilot position from Bell pilot Jack Wollums when he died and he crashed a P-39 air racer into Lake Ontario. In a handshake deal with Bell aircraft founder Larry Bell, Goodland had been promised the same deal as Wollums, including the big $150,000 bonus. These bonuses were fairly standard for test pilots at the time and were in recognition of all the flying accomplished over an entire project. The huge number of X-1 flights, increasing the speed in small increments, was driven by the NACA's desire to have nicely spaced data points on their graphs. Bell Aircraft received payment for those pre-acceptance flights and was in no hurry to end them. The soon-to-be U.S. Air Force, on the other hand, wanted a piece of the glory of breaking the sound barrier. This was especially important as North American aviation was putting the finishing touches on the first F-86, a real-world aircraft with supersonic-capable aerodynamics. At the time, aircraft speed records required the plane take off under its own power and achieve top speed at sea level, something the X-1 couldn't do. Yeager doesn't hold a world record, and his Mach 1.06 speed was at altitude where the speed of sound is lower, translating to just 700 miles per hour. It would have been bad for the USAAF or USAF officers running the X-1 program to be upstaged by the F-86, setting an actual world speed record before the X-1 accomplished its goal, so it's not surprising they decided to accelerate the program and replace Goodland with an actual Air Force pilot. Goodland's big bonus was simply a convenient excuse. I suspect Wolf had a bit of a hero worship for Jaeger, as he paints him in quite a flattering light. There are a few stories of those who encountered him that suggest Jaeger was, or is, not a very nice person. It is unfortunate that Wolf had to slander real people in what many take as a historically accurate book. Don. When I got his email, I was immediately reminded of what John Garth said when I interviewed him for the Tolkien episode. And I'm paraphrasing here, but basically John said, it's a shame to take the second lead characters in history and use them in whatever way that you'd like. And of course, John was talking about J.R.R. Tolkien's biopic, but with Don's email, it's a great reminder that that's a common thread in Hollywood. And when I say Hollywood, I know I say Hollywood in this podcast a lot. Basically, when I say Hollywood, I'm referring to the general film industry overall, not just those movies that get made in California. So thank you again, Don, for helping to fill in the story for one of the overshadowed characters in the movie. That brings us to an end of this episode. But before we go, there is one last thing I would like to do. 
And I've started this and I've never really heard a podcast share these stats for each episode. And I'm a big fan of being as open as possible. Now, from this side of the mic, in the podcasting community, anytime I see new podcasters and they ask for advice, one of the key things, one of the most overlooked things in podcasting is just how much time and effort it takes to create a podcast. It's very, very time uh, time intensive. And so that's why a lot of podcasters will eventually burn out. Um, uh, the average in the industry is seven to 10 episodes is typically how far a podcast uh, will go. Somebody starts to create it. And that's usually when they start to realize just how much time and effort it takes to create a podcast. But not only that, it also takes some money, some out-of-pocket expenses, uh, not only overall, but for each and every episode. With that said, here are the final stats for the creation of this episode. Today's episode took a total of 26 hours to create and cost $9.99 in out-of-pocket expenses. I really got lucky on this one. Most episodes cost a lot more with research materials, but because most of the sources that I use for this episode are old books from the 17th century in the public domain, this episode didn't really have a lot of out-of-pocket expenses, pretty much the movie itself. Time, on the other hand, (laughs) uh, that is a different story. And as I mentioned, that's one of those things. Time, of course, time is a limited resource. So many would argue that the, the time that it takes is the real expense of creating a podcast. Although I should point out that that time, 26 hours and and $9.99 and out-of-pocket expenses, that's only for this one episode. It doesn't include any of the ongoing costs. So the podcast hosting, website hosting for based on a true story podcast.com, the domain, the the cost of the software that I'm recording into, the the cost of the computer that it's recording on, the hardware, like the microphone I'm talking into, the the arm for the microphone, the cables, all of this stuff, the interface that it's connected to, all that stuff, of course, costs money and takes time to hook up and, and keep maintained. And so that does not account for any of that time outside of strictly writing, researching, and producing this one episode. And now that you know how long it took for this episode, if you're a podcaster, I'd encourage you to start sharing these stats with your audience. Hopefully overall, what I'm hoping is more people will start to appreciate the free entertainment that they get from podcasters. And I think one of the key ways that they can uh, they will do that is really just by getting to know how much time and money goes into creating podcasts. And then of course, on the flip side of that, they are completely free. So all of this time and effort goes into it and then turning around and giving that away as a completely free product. Now that segues great into this next section here because if you do want to help keep, based on a true story, ad-free, that time and effort really advertisements and sponsorships for a lot of podcasts, that's why you see that. If you want to keep, based on a true story, ad-free and independent, you can support this podcast, help me cover the costs and the time it takes to create this because I could be using that time for doing other things that will help me pay the bills. But if you'd like to see more of Based on a True Story, you can hop on over to basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a way of saying thank you, you'll get access to a ton of bonus content on the producer's feed. There's hours and hours of exclusive content on there that I think you'll love. In the meantime, if you're like Don, and as you're listening to this, you're thinking of a way that the Crucible overshadowed one of the lesser-known characters in history, and you'd like to shine a light on them, well, there's a lot of ways that you can add to the story. Probably the best way is to hop onto the Base on a True Story Facebook group and share it with everyone there. Or if you'd prefer to contact me directly, you can find me on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. And if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email, at dan at based on a true story podcast.com. Until we chat again, thanks so much for listening and bye for now. <laughs>